All right, take out your Bibles. Tonight we're going to be in the Old Testament. Old Testament in 2 Samuel chapter number 23. 2 Samuel chapter 23. I want to talk tonight about David's mighty men and learn some things by from their example, their situations, their challenges, and why they were called mighty men. Not everyone was given those accolades. Not everyone was talked about as being a mighty man for the Lord. So we're going to find out why tonight. And hopefully many people tonight will want to take up and follow their example and do the same thing. 2 Samuel chapter 23, and we'll begin reading in verse 8. And this is kind of a character study tonight, how to follow their example. So that as we say, when we stand before the Lord, we will hear some of these good words too, that we stood for the Lord. 2 Samuel chapter 23, beginning in verse number 8. We're going to talk basically about two of these men, only two of these men. But in this chapter, if I was read verse through verse 23, and then some other ones too, but they're listed in categories. And the ones we're going to find out about tonight really were the top, the top guys. You know, the world recognizes and honors meritorious behavior. The world even recognizes brave, bravery. And in the Bible, there's a lot of these men, kind of men around. You might, you're, you're probably familiar with some of the heroes in the movies like Rambo and Superman and some of the others along that line. And the world reveres those kind of men. But did you know the Bible talks about men like that? And they were godly men too. There's the big difference. Rambo was not a Christian, both in his uh, acting career and in his personal life, he is definitely not a Christian. N O T, that's obvious. But we're going to read about some that were Christians, were great men, and they fought battles for the Lord too. And some of the challenges they took up that we can learn by their example and hopefully personalize ourselves too, become like them. Now I'm just going to read a few verses here. 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 8. Uh, these be the names of the mighty men. Now, that's what I'd like to be known as. Mighty men. These are the names. These be the names of the mighty men whom David had fought with King David. David, a type of Christ. The Tachmanite that sat in the seat, chief among the captains. The same was, his name was, Adino, the Esnite. He lift up his spear against 800 whom he slew at one time. It was him versus 800 men. He attacked them. They attacked him. He killed all 800 of them himself. Pretty good. Verse 9. And after him was Eleazar, the son of Dodo the Ahohite, one of the three mighty men with David, when they defied the Philistines that were there gathered together to battle. And the men of Israel were gone away. So only these three stood with David at this time. These three uh, did these exploits when all the rest of the men of Israel were gone away. Verse 10. And he arose. This is uh, Eleazar. And he arose and smote the Philistines until his hand was weary. And his hand clave unto the sword. I don't know if you ever used some kind of tool. Maybe you worked out in the yard. Maybe you worked uh, somewhere. But you, your hand kind of just, just got to the place where it just kind of clenched into a certain position. As you're holding some uh, something like that. Until his hand was weary and his hand clave unto the sword. And the Lord wrought a great victory that day. Who wrought a great victory that day? The Lord. Remember that. The Lord wrought a great victory that day. And the people returned after him only to spoil. Now after him, verse 11. After him was Shema, the son of Agi, the Herorite. And the Philistines were gathered together into a troop uh, where was a piece of ground full of lentils. And the people fled from the Philistines. But he stood in the midst of the ground and defended it. Everybody else fled. He stayed. When others cowered and chickened out, as we would say, he did not. 
He stood the ground, defended it, and slew the Philistines. And who wrought a great victory that day? The Lord did. The Lord did. Father, help me as I preach on these qualities that these men had. And that, Lord, Christians in this room tonight and hear this message will seek to uh, exemplify and, and live the same way in our spiritual battle that we also fight. So thank you, Lord, for these examples. Help me as I preach to make it clear tonight what I'm trying to get across, that we can have these qualities. In fact, we need these qualities. Please help me as I preach. May the Lord be honored, uh, Christians really revived, and those that are not yet really born again. I pray for their salvation tonight, that they might yet believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, even tonight. For it is in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. All right, David's mighty men, their situations, the battles they fight. By the way, if you're going to be a mighty man, you've got to fight a battle. No one is given an award who let well enough alone. If you just sit around and think, well, that's the way it is. I'm not going to get involved. I'm not going to fight. I'm not going to do, uh, get involved in the spiritual battle and the spiritual things. Well, you're never going to get any rewards. You'll never be called a mighty man of God. A mighty man of God get in the battle. They fight the battle and they win the battle. I'm going to talk about some character qualities tonight. And the first one will be from verse number 8. The first man we saw there, Adino. I guess that's the way it's pronounced. But the first thing he did that I want to make note of tonight is he volunteered. He volunteered to do this in verse 8. Uh, These be the names of the mighty men whom David had, the Tachmanite that sat in the seat, chief among the captains. The same was Adino the Esnai, who lift up his spear against 800 whom he slew at one time. So he volunteered to do this. Everyone else, no one else was there. Here's 800 challenging him, 800 of the enemy attacking him, and he defeated all. I don't know how he did that, but I know God helps us too. But he volunteered. He didn't have to do this. He could have left with the others. He didn't have to withstand these individuals. But number one, he volunteered. He took on a challenge. If we're comfortable just sitting around and warming a church pew, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad people are here in church. Maybe God's called you to do something less visible. Maybe God's called you to be a prayer warrior. Maybe God's called you to be faithful and pray for our church and and pray for people to be saved. Everybody works in different ways. But I know that he took on a challenge. He wanted to do something here. And he volunteered to do this. If I would have to talk someone into doing something, if I wanted someone to do something and I had to talk to them and and I had to try to convince them to do this, and I had to try to twist their arm for them to do something, that's not the way we do things in our church. If I have to try to force somebody to do something they really don't want to do, uh, they're not going to do it in a good way. They're not going to do it because they love the Lord. They're not going to do it with a cheerful heart. They're going to do it because I might have put them on a guilt trip, or I might have twisted their arm behind the back, like I said, and that's not what I want in our church. I only want volunteers, people who volunteer to do things. Now, we know not everybody can do everything they'd like to do sometimes. That's just the way it is also. But Adino here, he took on the challenge. He took on a difficult challenge. 800 men, verse 1. And we're talking about when they just had swords and spears and shields. That's all they had. How could he defeat 800 men? I don't know, but I know he did it. And it's noted here in the Bible. And he is recognized for this. And he's honored for this. He lift up his spear against these 800 Philistine soldiers. Anyone. So number one, what we need to learn is to take on a spiritual challenge. Don't just sit around and warm a pew. Now again, not everybody's called to do everything. Not everyone is gifted to do different things. But take on a challenge. But to volunteer to do something that you're gifted to do, and there's a need for that to be done, and just take it on and volunteer. Take on that challenge. Number two, Adino also, and this is the important point, was outnumbered. 800 to 1. Christian friend, understand we're in the minority. We're in the minority, and when we fight these battles, most people are going to be not for us, but against us. We have to understand that we are outnumbered, and it seems like in our country, we're outnumbered more and more all the time, too. 
Uh, there's fewer and fewer of real Christians living that dedicated, separated, consecrated life for the Lord. There's fewer and fewer of those around nowadays. So we definitely are outnumbered, not only amongst the lost people around us, but even sometimes those calling themselves Christians. So we have a ministry of the minority. We have 800 against us. We might have more against us. I guess my question tonight is, how many are you willing to stand against? Think about that. How many are you willing to stand against? Now, he had to stand against these individuals, these 800 soldiers. He had to be against them. He was not for them. They were not for him. He was against them. Notice that word, against. Do you realize as a Christian, there's some things you need to be against? Do you realize the Christian life is a Christian life where you stand against certain things? You know, we stand against certain things in our church. There's certain music we don't have in our church. And I talk to people and sometimes they say, well, this church has this kind of music and another church and they're growing by leaps and bounds, supposedly, and they have more people there. But we're against certain things in our church. I'm against certain kinds of music coming into the church. We're against certain kind of doctrine. I really am against easy believism. Easy believism. You don't know what easy believism is. Easy believism is people that believe if you just get someone to pray the sinner's prayer that they're saved. That's easy believism. A lot of people say, well, they, they prayed the prayer, so they must be saved. That's easy believism. Friends, if you say a prayer, but there's no change after that prayer, a change in the desire for spiritual things, where God really changes your character and makes you born again, where there's a big difference afterwards. No, you're not saved. People say, well, they need to grow. No, they don't need to grow. They need to get saved yet. They can say all those prayers they want to, but I'm against, I'm against easy believism. And we take a stand against that. I try not to harp on it, though I feel like preaching about it every single Sunday morning and every single Sunday night. I feel like preaching about that. We're against Caesar believism. No, people are not saved if they say that prayer of salvation. Not unless they really got their heart right and they really repented of their sins and God's really changed their heart and their life is different now. No, they did not get saved. And we're against that easy believism. We're against that kind of music. We're against false doctrine. We're against those churches that believe that Mary was sinless. See, we're against things. Against things. Now, we have a reputation of being fighting Baptists. And I guess that's kind of true. <laughs> we really do. But we don't do it with a chip on our shoulder, though. We fight... Because we're trying to let people know what is right. We fight for right. It rhymes. I kind of like that. We fight for right. But we're against things. People today, they're saying, well, I don't want to be against anything. I want my ministry to be all positive. I want everything to just be flowery. And I want, I don't, everybody, God loves everybody. And, and everybody eventually will make it to heaven someday. We're against that kind of belief, we're against wrong doctrine, we're against wrong music, we're against wrong preaching, we're against wrong churches, we're against uh, the things that are wrong in this world spiritually, and there's a lot of things. Just like Adino here was called a mighty man of God, one, da one of David's uh, great soldiers and mighty men of God, because he stood against those 800. He stood against the enemy. He stood against those things. Now, we don't always just preach against everybody. I don't come here every Sunday and say, well, here's the person we're against this week. Uh, here's a church we're against this week. Or here's what we're against this week. No, we talk about a lot of positive things. The gospel is positive. If you're saved, you can go to heaven. But if you're not saved, you will go to hell. But that's not what God wants. That's not what I want. We want to see people saved. But we're against that. But I'm not going to get here every week and some people say, well, it seems like every week you're against somebody else. Every week you're against some other church. No, well, well we are. But there are a lot of good things in the Bible, a lot of positive things. God is a God of love. That sounds pretty good to me. But to take on a challenge, Christian friend, you have to understand you have to be against some things. You have to be against them. Just like Adino here was against this. Uh, number three, another quality you need to have is also, and it's sort of similar to being outnumbered, you need to also stand alone. You need to stand against, and you need to stand sometimes alone. 
the men of Israel were gone away. Eleazar was forsaken, the men of Israel had gone away, but he still stood and fought the battle in verse 9. And after him was Eleazar, the son of Dodo, the Hohite, one of the three mighty men of David, when they defied the Philistines, they were gathered together to battle, and the men of Israel were gone away. There were a few that fought the battle, but pretty much Eleazar and some of the others were standing alone. You think in the Bible, how many times this concept of standing alone was exemplified by some of the greatest Christians in the Bible. Noah, built in that ark, 120 years. Uh, his family did come along, so he wasn't completely alone, but it was just him and his family by the time he got done building that ark. Noah is an example of someone pretty much standing alone. Abraham is another one that had to leave his country Leave his people, leave his family. God told him to do that. He's pretty much out on his own. He had his family with him, yes, but he stood alone. Joseph, sold into slavery, almost killed by his own brothers. Joseph is one that had to stand alone. There he was in this foreign nation as a slave, as a servant. And he rose up in, in prestige and power because God blessed him in that way. But Joseph is one that had to stand alone. As a young boy, and we're thinking he was only maybe 16 to 18 years old when this happened. And here he is in this foreign land, and he still has a, a faith in the Lord, and, and he's one of the greatest types of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. Joseph was. And then we see Elijah. When he had his times of discouragement, he ran off. He, he fled a few times, but God took care of him. But he was one that stood before those 400 prophets of Baal and the 450 prophets of the groves. So 850 verses, versus Elijah. He had to stand alone there. Jeremiah, disliked by his own people. His own people said, no, uh, preach to us. Let us know what God's word is. But when he told them what God's word was, when he told the people, they didn't like it. They didn't accept it. He said, you're lying to us. They put him in a slimy pit. They imprisoned him themselves. But poor old Jeremiah, by himself, the only one telling them the truth. And they rejected it. But Jeremiah, by himself. And he could see the Lord Jesus Christ died for our sins on Calvary by himself. Those closest to him, his own disciples, fled him. Christian, this is the mark of Christianity. You have to learn and be willing to stand alone. There's some situations you're going to go through that no one else is going to go through. And you have to learn to stand alone. If your attitude is, well, I'll serve the Lord as long as others serve the Lord with me. It's not going to work. You have to be willing to stand alone, even if nobody else goes with you. Like that song says, though none go with me, still I will follow. Still, I will serve the Lord. Even if no one else does, I will. And when you have a church with people like that, and each one willing to stand alone, you've got a strong church. They don't necessarily need the other people around them, but it's a help, it's encouragement when God provides that way. But you have to learn how to stand alone. If everybody else leaves, you need to stand alone. You need to still continue serving the Lord. That's a challenge. Sometimes I've noticed as I... I try to encourage people and help people and personally sometimes we do discipleship with people and that's always a good thing encouraging but there comes a time christian please understand this there comes a time when i'm not going to be there to help you and there comes a time when no other christian is going to be there to help you that's a time when it's up to you you need to be able, your relationship with the Lord should be that I'm going to stand with the Lord even if I stand alone in this situation. I'm going to do what the Lord wants me to do here. Now, praise the Lord, in this age, in our country today, we have other Christians around. We have Christians in our church, other churches. Well, I know I, I'm always encouraged when I go to the uh, Buckeye Pastors Fellowship meetings. I tell the pastors there, I say, every time I go to one of those meetings, I feel like I've had a personal revival. 
I really have. I come back a little more enthused, a little more excited. But I mean, it's like a personal revival. I have. It's good to have other pastors around. It's good to hear other preachers are preaching. And it's good to have these fellowship meetings. When you talk with other pastors, you talk with these uh, other men that are going through some of the same things you're going through. It is encouraging. And it is a revival. But there are times when there's nobody understands. And no matter what anybody says or any, anybody beside you, it doesn't help. There's times when you have to stand alone. I've had those times. And honestly, folks, those are the most difficult times. No one understands really what you're going through. They don't understand it. They can't sympathize with you. They can say some nice things. They can say some sympathetic things, but they still don't get it. But you know one interesting thing and good thing about standing alone? You're never alone because the Lord's always there. No matter what, he's always there. But there are times, Christian, and those are special times, albeit very difficult times, when you are by yourself, and the only one who really understands is the Lord. There are those times. So here it was, Eliezer mainly forsaken, no others around him. He fought the battle like Noah was in that situation, Abraham, uh, Joseph, Elijah, Jeremiah, the Apostle Paul. And of course, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, always the greatest example. So Eleazar had to learn how to stand alone. We need to learn how to stand alone. If you always have to have somebody holding your hand to walk across the street, you're still a young child. You're still like a little toddler. Uh, once you get old enough, you ought to be able to walk across the street without somebody holding your hands. Without an adult next to you saying, now watch for traffic here. Watch for traffic there. Now take me by the hand. Now, okay, no traffic coming. Okay, let's walk across the street now. There's a time you need to grow up and learn to cross the street by yourself without having someone help you by the hand. All right, next thought, number four. Uh, Eliezer became weary and tired. The real test of our devotion to the Lord is when we get weary and tired. Will we continue to serve? Can the Lord count on us when we get tired? We get tired of going out to church. We get tired of being faithful to our Sunday school class. Uh, we get tired of being a witness to the Lord. We get tired of witnessing the people and seeing nobody saved. Uh, we get tired of inviting the people out to church and then promising that they will come out to church. And when Sunday rolls around, guess what? They're not here. And you got all excited, you're all enthused about that. Somebody's coming out to church. I invite somebody out to church, and then they don't show up. When you get weary and tired and just serving the Lord and being faithful, what will you do then? You know what Eleazar it says there in verse 10, because his hand clave unto the sword. You know when you get tired and weary, you will keep on being faithful because it's your habit. And Christian friend, that's a good thing. His hand clave to the sword, and he could not, not fight. Why? Because his hand was stuck on the sword. You know, that's the place we want to be too, friends. We want to be in a certain place where when we get tired and weary, we just don't feel like keeping up the battle, and we don't uh, feel like staying faithful like we used to be. When we become just tired of serving the Lord, when we become weary and well-doing, that we just keep at it because our hand is wrapped around that sword, and it's stuck to the sword, so to speak, and we're so used to fighting the battle, we're going to go on even in those difficult times, even in those weary sometimes, we're going to continue serving the Lord. That's what makes a mighty man of God. In the times of weariness, when you're tired and you're weary about these things, but you still stay faithful. Then you are a mighty man of God. But those times of weariness will test you, won't they? Being tired when you're weary. So those times of weariness, like they had here, he was tired, he was worn out, but he kept on fighting anyways. And the Lord blesses that. Now, uh, next point here too. I like the spunk of these guys. I hope that's a good word. I always like to use, use that word spunk. I like the courage that they had. 
I like that Caleb spirit, like Caleb had. Let's go into the land. We can well take it. God's given us the land. Give me that mountain. I don't want an easy time. I want that mountain. That's the Caleb spirit. Well, Eleazar had it too. Look at verse 9. Defied the Philistines. They were gathered together. He defied. Note the word there. Defied. Defied, I looked up in the dictionary. It means this. It means to resist and to oppose boldly and openly to go against the enemy boldly and openly he defied the philistines now we don't get in our churches and clench our fists and say we're going to fight the devil and I'm, I'm, I'm so excited i'm going to rush hell uh, with a squirt gun i said that that makes good preaching you know people kind of like that i'm just ready to take on anything. i'm ready to take on satan well you need to be Take a little, uh, you need to be, show a little resistance there. Uh, you need to be careful in those areas. But I know this, the Lord likes spiritual courage. When we're bold for him, the Lord likes that. David went to the battle. Goliath was, was quieting down all of Israel's army. He, he went out there and he challenged his real army. He says, send the champion. We'll fight. You send your champion. I'll fight your champion. We'll see who's going to win this battle. And the, the soldiers cowered. Not that they were, they were afraid to die. They would have given their lives for Israel. But the thing is, they had to go on that battlefield and they had to win. But here's young David. And he said, who is this Philistine? that defies the armies of the living God. And there's who does he think he is? I like that kind of courage. I like that kind of boldness. And that's what we need in Christians today. Eleazar defied. I like that word defied. To resist and oppose boldly and openly. Just like David did to Goliath. Again, we take a stand against things. We need to be against things. And we need to defy the enemy Satan himself. Not that we brag about how powerful we are and that we're going to defeat Satan. No, we don't do that. We brag about the Lord's power. If we have the victories and the victories we have, we honor and we glorify the Lord for that. Also, here's another thought. Just a little sideline, but I think it's an important one. I believe it's in verse number 10. Okay, these are the mighty men. These are the courageous men. Adino here and Eleazar. Now in verse 10. After the battle, notice what happens after the battle. He arose and smote the Philistines until his hand was weary, his hand clave unto the sword. And the Lord, Lord wrought a great victory that day. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. And the people returned after him only to spoil. Now, do you know what that means? In verse 10, they fought the battle. Eleazar, Adino, some of these other great men there. And after they got the victory, after they fought the battle, they sweated it out. God gave them the victory there. After that, what happened? The people came in only to spoil. You know what that means? A lot of people are not going to get in the battle. But once you win the battle, they're glad to come out and enjoy all the blessings of victory. Yeah. You know, when this church first started, and we had people join the church over the years too. You know, when this church first started, it was tough at first, you know, to get people to come out to the church. But there were some that really stood, stood by this church and they, 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 uh, they, they liked it. And so they came out faithfully. In fact, Oyaskis came right at the very beginning there. They, they've been here a number of years. Karen Hutchins is another one that had been here a number of years. And they just stayed with it through the tough times. Yeah. But then there were some that you might say came because, they, hey, everything looks good in this church. I mean, we've got a nice building here now. we never had this before. And we've got people coming out here. The attendance is growing. That's good, too. So sort of in this area. Now, this is not to insult anybody. This is not to put anybody down. But I'm just saying, those people that fought the battle, and then other ones come along for the spoil. The spoil is they come along and they get all the good things because of the battle was fought and the victory was won. Now, they come along just to enjoy the blessings. Not to fight the battle, just to enjoy the blessings. After the battle had been won. You know something, friends, that can discourage the ones who fought the battle. But let me say this, don't let it. 
Because the Lord knows you fought the battle. The Lord knows that. He will reward that. He'll remember that. Now, I know there's many people in our church that have fought different battles, and they've been faithful to the Lord over the years. That's the kind of people I'm talking about here that have done the battle, have fought the battle. There was that one time I saw that boxer. I've used this illustration, but let me use it again tonight. I turned on some TV channel, and this was many years ago. I guess there had been a, a fight in the ring, some boxing, boxers, had, and they were interviewing one of the boxers. And, and like I said, he looked terrible. All sweaty, his eye was all bugged out, you know, and black and blue. And he was cut here and blood, it was, blood was flowing here and there and everything. And I guess even, I think he even went to the hospital after that. Then as they're interviewing this man, I realize, now wait a minute, he's the one that won the fight. <laughs> And I looked at him, and here's the thought I had. So that's what a winner looks like. Amen. You fight the battles. You get hit. You get punched. You bleed. You're weary. You're down. But those are the ones that are David's mighty men. Those are the ones that the Lord takes note of us because they fought the battle. And here's the key. Here's the answer in verse 10 and verse 12. Why was this done? It says the Lord wrought a great victory in verse 10 and in verse 12. But he stood in the midst of the ground, defended and slew the Philistines, and the Lord wrought a great victory. The Lord has some victories to win, but he wants to use Christians to win the victories. See, it, it was Eleazar. He had to put forth his effort. He sure did. It was Adina, it was these other mighty men. They had to put forth the effort. But at the end, who gets the glory? The Lord does. Get it? You understand what I'm saying? The Lord gets the glory. You know why? Because he deserves it. You know why? Because he promises victory. If we'll go off into the battle and we'll stay faithful to him, we'll fight the battle and we'll take on those challenges. Even if we are outnumbered, so what? We'll take on those challenges and God will give us the victory. And we can give him the honor and glory by attacking that enemy and taking on those challenges and staying faithful to the Lord. And if we will do all those things, the Lord Almighty gets the glory. And that's why we're here. That's why we have a church. That's why I pastor a church. That should be why you're here in church tonight, to give him honor and glory. That's why. That's why. Let's personalize it. Do you want to give honor and glory to the Lord? I guess my conclusion tonight is it's not going to be easy sometimes. You're going to have to take on a challenge. It might wear you out. You might be outnumbered. You might have 800 versus one, but you know something with God's help, you can have that victory too. So my question tonight is, do you want to be one of not just David's mighty men, but of the Lord's mighty men? If you do, this is what it takes. This is what your situation will be. This is what your challenges will be. But let me say this, I don't think Noah is regretting it today. I don't think Jeremiah is regretting it today. I don't think Elijah, Joseph, Abraham, the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Peter, all his apostles died martyrs' deaths except for the Apostle John. I don't think one of them is regretting it today up in heaven. I think they're rejoicing that they were worthy to be, to even die that way, even be martyred that way. I think they're rejoicing, and I think we will too, and you will too, if you take the challenge to be a mighty man or lady for the Lord. But here's the challenge. Here's the situation. It's not going to be easy. Uh, Goliath was a pretty big guy. I read an article recently that they found somewhere. They dug up some city or something, and they found the people there averaged 10 feet to 12 feet in height in this city. And I think, well, there's Goliath. They say he was at least 10 feet high. And there's little David. I don't know how tall David was. It never says. He's about average height, maybe about my height. And he didn't have big bulging arms or anything like that. They didn't have weight training back then. He was just a normal guy. But it was God's power there. And what God did for him. Now, my question again tonight is, do you want to be a mighty man of God? If you do, here's what it's going to take. And here's what you're going to have to do. And it's worth it. That's what I'm saying. It's worth it. Father, I pray now that we'll... Consider ourselves to 
It's wonderful to read these stories in the Old Testament, these mighty men of God and taking on the challenge of the Philistines. And that one man, 800 versus him, and he defeated them all. Lord, we thrill to read stories like that. But Lord, help us to understand and remember that they are to be examples for us too to take on the challenges in this life. Not a physical challenge, but those spiritual challenges that will serve the Lord, even if we're outnumbered. And at those times that we're weary and tired, and we just keep on going anyway. So Lord, help us now. Challenge us that we can have more of those kind of mighty men and ladies in our church. Thank you, Lord, for the challenge that these men gave and showed and exemplified. I pray in a spiritual way, and in this day and age, we'll continue to follow that kind of example. To continue faithful when we're tired and weary. To continue faithful when we're outnumbered. To continue faithful when we have to stand alone. To continue faithful when we see those that come in just for the blessing time and weren't there for the difficult time and the, and the work and the labor and the battles and the fights. But Lord, I just pray that we'll do all our service to honor the Lord Jesus Christ who fought the greatest battle and gave us the greatest victory. So thank you, Lord, for that example. We do pray in Jesus' name tonight.